morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our latest media briefing on important health care issues in the news. I'm Dr. Adam Kassim, president of the Ontario Medical Association, which represents more than 43,000 physicians across the province. Tomorrow marks the second anniversary of the day Ontario declared a state of emergency as a result of COVID-19. And sadly, the number of confirmed deaths around the world from COVID-19 has now surpassed 6 million, and we know that the true death toll is much higher. In Ontario alone, more than 12,500 people have died from COVID, almost one-third of the 37,000 COVID-19 deaths across the country. And while the pandemic is not behind us, it seems that we are arriving at a place where we can manage the virus without overburdening our hospitals. And we have learned the importance in public health for being ready for future challenges. COVID-19 wasn't our first pandemic and it won't be the last public health crisis experienced around the world. So we're here today to talk about whether we are prepared for the next pandemic and ultimately what we have learned about what we need to do next time. Pandemic preparedness is one of the major areas of focus in the OMA's recently released Prescription for Ontario Doctors Five Point Plan for Better Healthcare. And you can find more details at betterhealthcare.ca. But for now, I'd like to give you a few of the highlights. Ontario's doctors believe planning for the next pandemic starts with a robust public health system that has the proper resources to protect the entire population's health. That means clearly defined roles across local public health units, Public Health Ontario, Ontario Health, and the Ontario Ministry of Health. It means strong local public health with adequate and predictable funding, highly qualified public health doctors, and investment in the information systems that can improve decision making. Being pandemic prepared, prepared ready, being ready for the next pandemic goes actually further than that. We're also recommending the following. Requiring by legislation a provincial pandemic plan that is updated every five years. Implementing a standardized pandemic plan across public health units, one that is flexible enough to account for differences and inequities across the province. Sufficient resourcing to ensure Public Health Ontario is the central scientific and laboratory resource during a pandemic or other public health emergency. And strategic investments for pandemic planning for public health units so their resources aren't drained from the other important work that they do. And finally, ensuring adequate funding to recognize additional workloads during pandemics. Now, we've learned a lot from this experience and done what we could to keep each other safe. The medical community led the pandemic response, implementing public health measures to stop the spread of the virus, while we worked to administer vaccines and keep our hospitals open and the health healthcare system going. And our work isn't stopping there. Today, we'll hear about the Omicron variant. We'll hear about what the Omicron variant taught us about being prepared for the next pandemic. What did we learn from the variant's ability to take hold? what new technologies are emerging to help us detect and control viruses, and what, if anything, has been done, has been identified as the next biggest threat. Finally, is a pandemic the only global force that has the ability to threaten our healthcare system? Or are the effects of climate change, things like flooding, fire, and water scarcity potentially the next global health crisis? These are some of the big questions we must think about so that we have a solid foundation on which we can build our response to the next public health emergency. And now I'd like to introduce our three esteemed guests who will give us their perspectives on whether we are ready for the next pandemic or whatever global health cha healthcare challenge may arise in the future. Dr. Jen Gomerman is a professor and Canada Research Chair at the Department of Immunology in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Most recently, she has been studying the antibody response to COVID-19. Dr. Ross Upshur is a physician at Hennick Bridgepoint Hospital. He's also head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He's a scientific director at the Bridgepoint Collaboratory for Research and Innovation and associate director of the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute. And Dr. Samantha Green is a family physician at St. Michael's Hospital. She's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and faculty lead in climate change and health in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. And she's on the board of directors for the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So to begin, Professor Gomerman, can you tell us a little bit about what you think we've learned from COVID-19 and the Omicron variant and whether you think we are prepared for the next pandemic? Sure, thanks for having me here. So um, with the Omicron variant, I think we learned a very important thing about our vaccines. What we learned was that people who have received three doses of vaccines make a very good immune response to Omicron. And what we've learned from an immunological perspective is that the three doses appears to be kind of a sweet spot in terms of generating an immune response that has enough breadth to see extremely divergent 
forms of what was originally the Wuhan virus. And this is really good news because if we get another variant, and there's good chances we will, that's likewise quite divergent and has the capacity to invade, evade our, uh, our first defense is the antibody response. Um, the good news is that the systemic immunity that was generated through vaccination is likely going to give us good protection against disease, provided it lasts. And so far, um, the uh, research is showing that if we, if we predict how long these memory cells will last, they do last a very long time. So that's the good news. Um, the other thing we learned was that as our antibody levels decline, and that's a very normal, natural thing to happen, uh, our risk of getting breakthrough infections, of course, increases. And that's because antibodies are the first firewall against uh, a virus. Um, and so these vaccines have been really amazing at preventing severe COVID-19, and the hospital statistics show that. However, um, I think for future pandemics, what we really need to do is think about second generation vaccines that provide protection within the nose and the mouth, which is where we encounter the virus. Um, and so these would be um, in the form of a, of a nasal, an intranasal boost, not an intranasal vaccine, but an intranasal boost that builds on the immunity that you get from the shot in the arm and trains the immune system to go to that location so that it's ready. And I think that that will be a really big advance because one of the things we've really struggled with in this pandemic is the constant recirculation of the virus and person to person transmission, even in highly vaccinated populations. So that's something that Canadians should really shoot for in the future as we prepare for the next pandemic. Um, so those from an immunological point of view are some of the things that I would like to see happen. Also from a technology point of view and from a cooperation point of view, I would like to see academics like myself um, work more closely with some of the public health agencies so we can sequence and identify variants before they hit us. So it's kind of like the Wayne Gretzky metaphor of not knowing where the puck is, but knowing where the puck is going is really going to be important moving forward. And that's going to take some coordination. And lastly, the governments, both federal and provincial, have worked really hard uh, during this pandemic and they've scrambled to get some kind of pandemic infrastructure in place in terms of scientific networks. And what I really hope for is that those networks are retained. For example, Covarnet is a network I'm part of that looks at variants of concern uh, as they hit us coming fo uh, moving forward. And I would hate to see that those networks become dismantled because then you got to start from scratch all over again. So those, those are the things I've learned throughout the pandemic and particularly during the last Omicron wave. Thank you, Professor Gromerman. Very important lessons to have learned and, of course, hopefully being implemented uh, into the future as we think about uh, our, our pandemic preparedness for that future. Uh, now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Upshur, who can give us his assessment of the threat of variants and new viruses. Dr. Upshur, what new technologies have been developed to help us deal with them and what can what is Canada's role to play in the global response to pandemics in the future? Thank you for the invitation to be here, uh, Dr. Kassam. It's a great honor and privilege to uh, share a panel with such distinguished colleagues. So I'm going to start with some broad framing that uh, if we're going to truly have a, a better uh, pandemic response, we need to remember that pandemics are global events, and we're only as strong as the weakest link in the global uh, uh, community. And uh, I like to quote the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, who's reinforced time and again that we're not safe until everyone's safe. Now, we have actual, so that means we need to support and strengthen global institutions like the World Health Organization and support multilateral uh, initiatives like the ACT Accelerator, which we know for COVAX, uh, continue to uh, pledge and deliver aid uh, and work towards uh, better uh, intellectual property waivers and tech transfers. But the real star of the show, I think, technologically in terms of uh, COVID response has been uh, the capacity to use uh, uh, sequencing that uh, Professor Gomerman mentioned uh, to actually give us insight into the evolving and changing nature of the of the viral pandemic. And uh, I think the identification, early identification of variants of concern, variants of interest, uh, global collaboration and global networks in Canada needs to uh, pitch its future response to uh, uh, pandemics as part of a global response. 
Uh, so what can we do? Well, we have huge uh, intellectual capacity and ability in the scientific and clinical communities uh, that we have here in Canada. And we can start to, uh, you know, enhance uh, uh, capacity to uh, produce vaccines, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, support, uh, you know, regional networks uh, globally. So it's what we found uh, uh, as a bit of an Achilles heel is the concentration of vaccine production in only a few locations. And, uh, you know, we put together a new facility in Canada. We should think of that as a global public good and find ways to be involved in the uh, preparation and distribution of low cost vaccines in future pandemics, uh, because as I say, we're not safe until everyone's safe. So we've learned that we have the capacity to rapidly identify variants, to rapidly develop, implement, and evaluate vaccines, and the same for uh, uh, therapeutics and diagnostics. But I think what we ought to be doing is aspiring for Canada to be best in class in pandemic response. And I think it picks up on some of the points made by Professor Gomerman that we utilize uh, all of our assets, uh, academic and clinical, uh, provincial and national, so that we're able to not only protect our own population, but to make strong contributions to uh, uh, global health and global security as well. Um, so I'll stop there and look forward to questions. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Dr. Upshur. Very important in terms of being able to harness that collaborative intellectual capital uh, and try and deploy that around the world uh, in a meaningful way. And as we start thinking about sort of globalization and sort of global cooperation on other areas, including security and economic development, certainly uh, global health should be on that uh, on that radar as well. Now I'll turn to Dr. Green. Dr. Green, what do you believe are some of the next big global threats that may not necessarily be a pandemic, but instead a widespread health crisis related to the effects of climate change? Thank you, and thank you so much for, for having me on this panel. Well, as you probably know, the World Health Organization and the medical journal The Lancet have both called climate change the biggest health threat of this century. And the latest International Panel on Climate Change report confirms devastating effects on health and health systems over the coming decades as we warm to 1.5 degrees and probably more. Even as we continue to experience morbidity, mortality, and health system threats from the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis remains the bigger threat. Over the last year alone, at just 1.2 degrees of warming, close to 700 people died in BC's heat dome event, crops failed in Manitoba droughts, flooding took out entire communities in BC and Newfoundland, and wildfires engulfed large parts of Western Canada and Northern Ontario. Furthermore, we know at this moment that there is no link proven between climate change and, and COVID-19, but we do know that further climate change will lead to habitat disruption, leading to new proximities between humans and animals and vectors, likely leading to further zoonotic spillover events and future pandemics. So certainly climate change is a driver for future pandemics. A recent Canadian Medical Association survey demonstrated that nine out of 10 physicians across Canada are very concerned about climate change. And there is a growing movement amongst physicians to do more to tackle the growing health threat of the climate emergency in three main ways. First, we must reduce the health harms of climate change through patient level and health system level adaptation, such as providing our patients with appropriate emergency preparedness plans and by preparing our health system for disruption. Second, we must also reduce the direct harms caused by the health system itself by reducing the emissions produced by the health system. And Canada actually signed on to the World Health Organization's uh, health program at the COP26 climate change meeting in November, which has committed us to develop a climate resilient and low carbon health system. And then finally, physicians can reduce the health harms of the climate emergency through leadership and advocacy. And the Lancet has called the climate crisis also the biggest health opportunity of our time and acting on climate change will lead to tremendous health benefits through reduced air pollution related illness, increased active transportation and an increase in plant rich diets. So we can learn from the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and advocate for transformation of our society and health system to tackle the climate emergency. 
Well, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Green. And certainly very important as we start to think about a transition to a green economy, a green society. And in fact, the OMA will actually be examining the role of climate change in healthcare in more detail at our OMA Talks event on April 21st, which is, of course, the eve of Earth Day. And details on how to register will be announced soon on OMA.org and our social media channels. I just wanted to thank Drs. Gomerman, Upshur, and Green for your thoughtful insights into this important discussion about preparing for the next pandemic. Uh, from, for folks in the media, we're now going to open up our Q&A session. Uh, Ashley Molnar will be moderating this portion of today's briefing, so please put your questions in the Q&A chat. I know some of you have already done so, so thank you, and if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to add them again. And if we don't get to your questions due to time, the media team will follow up with you. And you can also email media at OMA.org with additional requests for interviews, and we'll also have a recording of this session available later this afternoon. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley. Thank you very much, Dr. Kassam. Our first question is for Professor Gomerman. With cases rising again in Europe, could Canada see a spring COVID wave? It's certainly in the realm of possibility. And I think there has been an uptick of cases in, in Quebec as well. Um, so that is um, certainly possible. Um, and, we, and I should also add that there's no guarantee that we're not going to get an, another variant um, uh, beyond Omicron. I think most uh, scientists would expect that that uh, can very well happen. So yes, we could be getting an uptick. Thank you very much. Our next question is for Dr. Upshur. Does Ontario have enough antibody treatments available? What is the public health advice for when patients should access antibody therapies? It's a, a great question, and there is a, actually quite a large availability of oral medication that the federal government has purchased. So we're, we're not in a, a defenseless state. Not only do we have uh, very effective vaccines, we have increasingly powerful uh, both uh, medications that can be delivered in the hospital for very sick people, but oral medications that can be used in the community. And in fact, I've been part of a, a group that's putting in a proposal for a trial to evaluate some of these oral medications. Uh, some of them will be in reasonably good supply. You know, we, I'm not going to say anything about supply because supply chain instability seems to be the watchword of 2022. Uh, but uh, the point of the matter is there are uh, available uh, oral medications or available intravenous medications uh, to treat people with, uh, you know, COVID infections. Uh, we also know a lot better about how to manage them in the hospital and in the intensive care unit. Uh, so unlike the first wave, which was small, or the Delta wave, which was challenging, I think we're in a much better position with a large number of medical uh, countermeasures to be able to uh, respond to uh, any uh, uh, surgeon cases that we might see. I don't have the exact numbers on the supply, but I know that there's a fair amount out there. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Nushin Ziafadi from the Canadian Press. And this question is for Professor Gomerman. How important is it to tackle misinformation in a future pandemic? And how do you suggest we do so? It's absolutely essential to have a coordinated comms effort to tackle misinformation. This is um, a major part of um, the uh, uh, Covarnet that I'm part of and, and other uh, pandemic response uh, collectives. Um, we know that the um, that misinformation in our digital age and in our um, highly social media cognizant age can travel very quickly. And um, it, it, I think to tackle it, really, we have to um, call out misinformation as soon as it happens, because usually once it's in print or on a screen, uh, the damage is being done. It's being circulated. It's being amplified. And so we have to be, uh, I think, more proactive in, in messaging as, as experts, as physicians, before the misinformation comes out. Um, and so I think that would be, um, this is outside of my area of expertise. I urge you to also ask Tim Colfer field the same question, but I think being um, more in an offensive than defensive position is probably a good strategy moving forward and um, making sure that the way we deliver that message is sensitive and is able to capture what is, you know, our Canadian population, which is very diverse. Um, so that's my non-expert take on that. 
Thank you. Our next question is from Len Gillis with Sudbury.com for Dr. Kassam. Dr. Kassam, does the OMA feel the need to take a more proactive role in any future pandemic to reduce the backlog of medical visits and consultations such as we saw occur in the past two years? So one of the unfortunate legacies so far of COVID-19 has been this growing need for getting through a backlog of care that now has expanded to close to 21 million healthcare services in the province of Ontario. That means smaller problems are becoming bigger problems, and it includes and it runs the gamut of our healthcare system, including primary mental health care, but also surgical and procedural care as well. And so this is absolutely something that needs to be a focus for the years ahead. It's something that we have been calling for in our prescription for Ontario. It's something that we've also been advocating for at both the federal and provincial level. We know that healthcare is a team sport and we have been asking uh, the federal government to increase their Canada health transfers to 35% of provincial and territorial health spending up from the current 22%. So we believe that there is a role to play for all of this collaborative uh, efforts for the future and we know that this is a top priority not only for the profession but also for the patients whom we serve. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. This next question is from Adrian Williams with CBC French, and this is for um, Professor Gomerman. Um, they're wondering if you could please summarize the main things that Canada could put in place in order to be more prepared for a new public health crisis. They would also like to know if you are worried about the subvariant BA2 and if you think the province is giving enough data to properly monitor the evolution of the pandemic. In English or en français? Um, I believe they like it in French if possible. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, alors la première question c'était uh, qu'est-ce qu'on il faut faire pour être plus préparé pour l'avenir? Um, et um, comme j'ai dit, um, uh, ça fait quelques minutes, il faut avoir des um, des efforts qui sont uh, pas seulement à notre institut, mais aussi um, qui, uh, qui sont dans toutes les provinces, qui um, um, utilisent les, les disciplines qui sont très différentes. Alors, l'immunologie, la, la médecine clinique, la biochimie, toutes ces choses um, viennent ensemble pour, um, pour, pour qu'on soit préparé pour la prochaine pandémie. Ah, J'excuse, mon, mon français, c'est pas Très bien. <laughs> Et la deuxième question, c'était, what was the second question? They would like to know if you're worried about the sub-variant BA2 and if you think the province is giving enough data to properly monitor in the evolution of the pandemic. D'accord. Alors, BA2, c'est très, um, c'est pas trop différent que BA1, mais c'est plus uh, transmissible. Alors, uh, ça peut que dans des populations qui ne sont pas très vaccinées, que ça peut vraiment um, causer de, beaucoup d'infections de, uh, et peut-être des maladies pour ceux qui sont vaccinés, mais pas un, ont des uh, systèmes immunes qui sont um, uh, fragiles. Um, alors, il faut qu'on soit um, um, préparé pour um, ce que uh, le BA2 de, de va, va faire ici en Canada et ça vient. Uh, si nous uh, savons, ce, uh, si on peut savoir uh, quelles infections sont BA2, je pense qu'on ne peut pas à ce moment-là. Uh, je pense que uh, c'est difficile parce qu'on ne fait pas beaucoup de, um, de PCR. Il faut faire du um, uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, Dr. Upshur, um, would you agree we'd have to sequence for BA2? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we can't see what we don't sequence. Alors, si on fait pas le uh, séquence, uh, on va se pas savoir que uh, uh, de, uh, pour le BA2, qu'est-ce qui se passe. Alors, il faut uh, vraiment continuer à faire um, les tests. And sorry, you. I'm really bad French. I did my best. <laughs> That's okay, Professor Gomerman. Um, we were wondering if you could now maybe summarize your answer um, in English for the other media that are here today. Yes. So in terms of pandemic preparedness, we need to continue to um, uh, maintain some of the infrastructure that we had to hastily build in the beginning at, in 2020. And this infrastructure is not institutional, but rather cross-institutional and cross-country, cross-province. Um, and it needs to bring together not just academics, but government 
and it needs to be interdisciplinary. What we've really learned, and I'm sure um, Dr. Upshur and Dr. Green will agree with me, um, as well as Dr. Kassam, is that uh, you can't solve the pandemic with just immunologists or just with clinical medicine. You need to solve it with all sorts of tools, including um, uh, communications to combat misinformation, um, engineering to make better uh, tests to make better vaccines it's it's really a multidisciplinary problem and so we've done that over the last two years we're really tired and we need to not just swipe that away we need to keep that in place so that we're prepared for the next pandemic because we've had three zoonotic events with coronaviruses uh, since 2003 we've had SARS MERS and now SARS-CoV-2 we'd be fooling ourselves to think that there's not another one coming and so we need to retain that infrastructure. Now, as for BA2, we know that BA2 is very similar to BA1 in terms of what the virus looks like, but it is more contagious. It's more transmissible. Um, and it's really approaching the level of contagiousness that we have for measles. And so this thing is going to rip through in the same way Omicron ripped through unvaccinated populations and people who are vaccinated um, but have um, decreasing antibody levels. This will happen as well. Um, and so if you have been infected against BA1 uh, and you're vaccinated, you, you, you may not be infected against BA2, but lots of people weren't infected with BA1. So that's the Omicron strain. So it's, yeah, it's going to, uh, it's going to continue to rise. And no, we, we're kind of going blind because we're not testing as much as we were. And to really test comparatively between BA1 and BA2, we need some good sequencing. Thank you very much. Our next question is for Dr. Green. In terms of climate change, what are the public health concerns we should be paying more attention to? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I summarized many of them. Uh, the, the, the heat dome that occurred in BC could very well happen here in Ontario, uh, and we need to be prepared for more extreme heat. Uh, similarly, the wildfire smoke uh, that did make its way to Toronto last summer from northern Ontario is likely to recur. We're also at risk of, of flooding events um, and drought that will affect crops and lead to rising food prices. And so rising food prices is a concern for food security among many of our patients. Um, and, and I'll just add that, um, like Professor Gomerman um, said uh, with respect to future pandemics, we likewise need a multidisciplinary uh, response and a multidisciplinary preparation for the effects of climate change. We also need to tackle misinformation about climate change and uh, really institute a broad public education campaign that tells the truth about the health impacts of the climate crisis in order to convince our society that we really need to, to take transformative action right now to keep and limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees. Thank you, Dr. Green. This next question is from Nushin Ziafadi with the Canadian Press, and this is for all of our panelists. Do you believe there should be a formal inquiry into how the COVID-19 pandemic was handled in Ontario and Canada at large in order to prepare for future pandemics? I don't mind starting. So we need to go back to SARS-1, where there were three major commissions of inquiry, quite comprehensive, quite lengthy. Uh, interestingly, in January 2020, I was speaking with a colleague, we were planning a symposium for 2023 to on the 20th anniversary of SARS-1 to look at the commissions of inquiry and to sort of do a report card on how we've done on the recommendations made then. So I think, yes, there will be numerous uh, uh, commissions of inquiry. I, I don't think we need to ask for it. I think they will come and there's already been a discussion. Uh, the question is whether this will, uh, you know, be, uh, will it be provincial, will it be federal, who are going to be the, uh, uh, the people doing the evaluations and the inquiry. Uh, I've heard uh, some people say that it should be independent and international in nature to look at the Canadian response. I think we should actually in encourage uh, cooperation amongst the different inquiries so that we don't have duplication of effort, uh, that there's a consistency to the kind of questions that are being asked and the information that's being sought and the manner in which it, uh, the findings are communicated. But more important, and this is if we're going to talk about pandemic planning and preparing for the future, we need to really seriously take uh, into uh, consideration the uh, recommendations that are made and have a process for 
evaluating whether those recommendations are being acted upon and implemented. Uh, because I can assure you, I, I've written grumpy papers about this and I promise to be positive today, but just for a minute, uh, the only lessons we've learned from previous epidemics is that we don't like to learn lessons. And a lot of the things that have happened are structurally the same. We're repeating, you know, we're spinning our wheels and doing the same thing over and over again. This is our opportunity to not repeat mistakes from the past, to actually create a system that's resilient, not wait for the uh, epidemic to be declared and then say, where's all our resources? Where's our stockpiles? I mean, we went through this through SARS-1, uh, H1N1, which hasn't had a lot of discussion was a global pandemic. We've had six uh, public health emergencies of international concern since the uh, international health regulations were revised in 2005 after SARS. So there's a huge amount of global experiences with either local ep epidemics or uh, epidemics that become public health uh, emergencies of international concern. So if we haven't woken up yet and learned lessons, uh, I'm not sure when we will. And if the commissions of inquiry are to put in sustainable, enduring changes that uh, permit us to be ready in the future, then I think they would be a good thing. If they're just an exercise in uh, you know, recommendations that nobody takes seriously, then I don't see the point of them. So, so that was a bit frank, um, over. <laughs> Professor Gomerman, I believe you have something to say. Yes. Yeah, so um, I just want to add to that that you know we've certainly made mistakes over the last two years. I mean, we had a lot to learn, um, but if we don't error the mistakes, and then we're, we're not going to progress. I think one of the biggest things that was different in this pandemic was the implementation of new technology, so mRNA vaccines, and those have been a stunning success, as I alluded to earlier, with respect to protection against severe COVID nineteen disease. But we were really learning uh, as we went um, how these vaccines would uh, deal with new infections. And um, I think that we have to revisit how we're going to vaccinate moving forward, what that's, what that's gonna look like. Um, now that we have really a, an amassing wealth of data that's looked at the efficacy of these vaccines and some of the correlates of protection that these vaccines provide. And so I think for that reason alone, let alone all the other things that um, Dr. Upshur just mentioned, I think we'll, we'll definitely need a scientific inquiry into um, how to best use these new tools that have been life-saving. Thank you. Do any of our other panelists want to add anything? Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Um, our next question is for Dr. Kassam from CBC French. Uh, they're wondering, is the OMA um, already working with the province to put in place a plan to be better prepared for a new health crisis? Do you think the province is receptive to your suggestions? Bon, pas, pas comme uh, Dr. Gummerman, je vais répondre en, en anglais. Uh, C'est beaucoup plus facile pour moi de, de le faire. But, um, uh, absolutely. I, I think that we are uh, in constant dialogue with uh, all of our health system partners, including the provincial government, including healthcare institutions and organizations, including, uh, you know, entities like Public Health Ontario, Alpha and others. And so um, I, I think that we it, we are in a moment, and this is what Dr. Upshur and Dr. Gummerman were discussing before, is how do we continue to, to, to maintain our preparedness over time? And how do we not let our systems and our approach atrophy uh, in periods of perhaps disuse like we've seen in the past? And so um, I think that uh, that this is obviously clearly on the minds of, of not only politicians who are, uh, you know, on the cusp of an election here in Ontario, but more broadly across the country. How do we continue to, to ensure that we are providing the best possible care and protecting as many people as, as efficiently and as effectively as possible? So I do think that the province is receptive. I do think that the, the governments across the country are receptive because this is sort of a, um, an existential threat to in many ways to, to the provinces and, and our unions. So uh, yes, I think the answer to your question is that there is there is dialogue and that there, that, that, that continues to be quite robust. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. This next question is for Dr. Upshur. Is there, a is there a potential that a new variant could come around that is worse than Omicron? 
Yeah, I think that's uh, within the realm of possibility. I think we should, we would be foolish not to uh, countenance that. And I think this is why we need uh, good surveillance systems that are connected globally that are doing sequencing on a regular basis. And, and it's not just the coronavirus family that we need to worry about. Uh, you know, a lot of the attention prior to this and pandemic planning was for influenza viruses, which is a, a larger and I would say vast or mutating uh, uh, group of viruses. And then, you know, the other thing that the global community was thinking about is the so-called disease X, that is an unidentified as yet uncharacterized virus that emerges uh, usually from a zoonotic host uh, that has pandemic potential. But rather than everybody being worried about this all the time, if we invest in surveillance and public health capacity, uh, we can let people do that work of being on guard and protect, you know, uh, watching out and uh, uh, and being able to alert populations and health systems to the emergence of new threats as they come. And as Professor Gummerman was saying, we can deploy these new technologies to rapidly develop vaccines and implement them, uh, and uh, uh, you know, get them out to people when needed. But that's that's part of what a future pandemic preparedness uh, global environment would look like in Canada would be a very important player in those uh, situations. Thank you, doc Dr. Upshur. A follow-up question for you. Um, if there is another wave, is Ontario's healthcare system ready to handle another surge in cases? I think everybody is exceptionally tired. Uh, would we be happy to see another wave? Absolutely not. Uh, would we roll up our sleeves and get to down to doing the work? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think we should be incredibly grateful to the hard work that all frontline clinicians, uh, be they physicians, nurses, respiratory technologists, that everybody has done, public health practitioners. Uh, you know, we are still already willing and able to respond. Uh, I think we have the but we still need to have the tools and the public support to do our jobs to the best of our capacity. Uh, you know, I think we've shown with Omicron and with Delta that we are capable of managing this, but we need the resources to do it. And we should be prepared. Uh, I mean, that's the, if there's one lessons we've learned, uh, you know, we've had four waves now, uh, there could be fifth and sixth, who knows, but we need to be vigilant and we need to be prepared and we need to support frontline healthcare providers to be able to do their jobs. Thank you, Dr. Upshur. The next question is for Dr. Green. Are we dropping masks too soon? Do school kids need to continue to wear masks? For me? <laughs> um, or for the other panelists, maybe. If another panelist would like to jump in, um, perhaps uh, Professor I mean, yeah. My 15-year-old is going to be wearing a mask to school next Monday. Uh, we'll find out. Thank you very much. The next question is from Len Gillis with Sudbury.com for Dr. Kasim. Has the opioid crisis or situation in Canada uh, become, a pan become part of the pandemic um, that we're just not aware of, or does it even qualify to be described as such? Well, it's certainly a crisis that we have to address. So in fact, in October, we were up in Sudbury uh, launching our northern platform, which has a high focus and a very significant focus on the opioid crisis up in northern rural and remote communities that suffer disproportionately as a result uh, of opioid-related deaths and, and, and addictions. And in fact, it's one of our key pillars in our five-point plan, which is to expand mental health services and addiction services for folks in need. We know that over the past 24 months, the opioid crisis has expanded and has actually gotten to be quite a significant issue um, as a result of the pandemic, but also even before the pandemic. It's great that we're still having an, have an ability to have a conversation about mental health. I think the stigma, while still, while still alive in the space, is, is certainly being you know, chipped away at. But we have, we have a long way to go. And I know that there are commitments both at a federal and a provincial level. There are now ministries uh, you know, specifically dedicated to mental health. And, and this is something that we are encouraging of and are going to continue to advocate for not only in the next several weeks and months leading up to the election, but, but well beyond. Oh, you're muted, Ashley. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Appreciate that. Um, this next question is for all of our panelists. What, in your opinion, is the first most important pandemic preparedness step Ontario needs to take? Who wants to go first? Have a plan. And 
<laughs> but as, as you know, and uh, uh, have a, a really well articulated plan that outlines uh, all of the components, uh, who does what, how it's going to be resourced. Um, and uh, if you keep, I think, you know, what uh, Dr. Kassel was saying, uh, keep it alive, keep it refreshed, keep it up to date, uh, but without a plan, uh, you're going to be uh, really stuck. So the most important thing, uh, step for uh, pandemic preparedness is to have a plan. I would add to that consistent messaging, um, admitting to the public when we don't have answers, um, and but being very clear um, about what we do know and how we can protect ourselves. I mean, and with yeah, I mean, with respect to climate change, uh, the federal government has committed to a national adaptation strategy, um, and we need something similar at a provincial level. We we need to be prepared for the effects of climate change, and then on the flip side, we also need a very robust mitigation plan. So um, we need to commit to deep enough cuts in our emissions that uh, they're consistent with keeping global warming to less than 1.5 degrees. Thank you very much. Thank you for your responses. Our next question is for Dr. Kassam. Dr. Kassam, what is the OMA doing to prepare for the next pandemic? Well, we're hosting things like this, um, but uh... What I would say is that over the past 24 months, I, I believe the OMA has played an extremely valuable and, and frankly a leadership role, not only in the pandemic, pandemic response by being able to advise a variety of different tables, whether that's government, public health and others, but I do think that our role has become almost a convener in chief uh, for a variety of different stakeholders to come to the table. And I think that is um, going to be a very important facet of our leadership moving forward as an association. And frankly, it's it's our membership, uh, you know, the, our physicians right across the province have been at the tip of the spear. They've provided leadership in the grassroots, on the front lines, in the trenches. Um, and so that's going to continue. But I think that as we think about uh, the future, as we think about what a roadmap for the future of healthcare might look like in this province, and, 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 and of course, being part of that is, is being prepared for a pandemic or a public health crisis in an emergency, that's going to require, once again, our, our constant uh, vigilance that other panelists have already talked about but also figuring out a way to transform healthcare uh, to ensure that we can deliver timely and effective and efficient care uh, to all of those uh, folks that, that need it. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Follow-up question for you. How can we ensure pandemic planning takes place and is regularly updated per your recommendation in the prescription for Ontario document? Yeah, so I think the first thing that we think about is, as Dr. Upshur was talking about, having a plan. And so I think that there are very, you know, there, there are many ways that we can establish what a good direction would be for the future. And then, and then of course, and that, and what our sort of game plan has been is using this prescription for Ontario as if not only a roadmap, but if, but ultimately, as Dr. Upshur was talking about earlier, almost like a report card um, to, to be able to look at a metric, look at some accountabilities and hold those, uh, those agencies, those institutions, those governments uh, accountable for making to, to, for, for protecting all of us. And so really having a plan, sticking to the plan, executing on the plan, and then ultimately learning about whether or not we need to modify that plan based on a variety of different factors. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Uh, we are starting to get closer to the end of our Q&A session. Just a couple of questions left. So um, for the media who are attending today, if you do have any additional questions, I'll ask you to please enter them into the Q&A chat um, right now. Thank you. Um, so our next question is for Dr. Green, and we're we would like you to elaborate on your opening remark about how the healthcare system contributes to climate change. Um, you had mentioned something about carbon emissions in particular. Certainly, yes. Um, the, the Canadian healthcare system contributes 4.6% 4 of Canada's uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and it's also the third most intensive healthcare system on the planet, uh, third to the United States and Japan. So that means we uh, produce um, the third most emissions per healthcare dollar spent in the world. Uh, so there's a lot of work that that can be done and, and that is being done to reduce the harms um, and specifically the, the climate harms of delivering healthcare. And we can continue to deliver healthcare that is high quality and effective while, while reducing our carbon emissions. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. Our final question today is for all of our panelists. I'm going to start with um, Dr. Upshur, if you want to take the lead on this. Um, the question is, what, if anything, can individuals do to prevent another pandemic? It's a great question. Uh, I think it, what individuals can do is uh, exercise their uh, democratic uh, franchise uh, to vote for uh, candidates and governments that support uh, robust public health and pandemic preparedness. Uh, there's a lot that you, you know, because a pandemic is a global event. There's really, to be honest, not much that individuals can do in their day-to-day -day life, uh, except be good, you know. If, if, I think a lot of the things that they can do to mitigate uh, climate change would actually uh, do a lot to help uh, prevent and reduce uh, emergence of new uh, viruses. But the usual things about you know, personal hygiene that we've learned are really important, keeping yourself as healthy as possible. Uh, that's going to stop you from being vulnerable for a pandemic. But the forces that actually shape uh, pandemics are global, they're large, and they require coordinated efforts from global institutions. And so I, I think I'll stick with my point uh, that uh, the most powerful thing anybody has is a vote in a democratic system uh, and to uh, ensure that uh, governments are responsible because it's a public health uh, responsibility to protect, you know, to create resilient, healthy communities. And part of that is health promotion, but health protection. So we need to be uh, uh, supporting those uh, uh, governments that will actually uh, protect us and uh, improve our health. And I would add that um, it's true that um, there's not a lot we can do individually to stop a pandemic, but we can um, encourage uh, um, preparedness for when it does happen. We need to, to back up our healthcare workers. We need to back up science. We need to um, fight misinformation when we see it. Um, we need to continue to fund science. And I'm, I'm concerned that um, pandemic, there was a lot of um, spending for pandemic science, which was really appropriate, but we need to continue that research after the pandemic is over so that um, when the next pandemic comes along, we have new tools ready um, to, to be able to fight whatever that new foe is going to be. So um, science doesn't stop when the pandemic ends. Science actually has to keep going, if anything, accelerate. And we know that for example, the Biden administration is putting a huge amount of money into science moving forward. And so it'd be great if Canada could, could keep up with that too. I know we have a lot of other things going on right now, but um, it would be good to make sure that that's a priority moving forward. Just add, um, and it applies to both the climate crisis and, and future pandemics. I think we need an ongoing focus on equity. Um, and so individuals can, can again, pressure politicians and really advocate for uh, protecting groups that are more at risk, groups that are marginalized and vulnerable. And, you know, for example, um, a universal paid sick days program in Ontario um, would help protect workers, you know, not only for, from the current pandemic, but from future diseases as well. The only thing is get vaccinated. Um... So uh, that's an individual choice that can be made. Uh, yeah, to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and to the media for all of your questions. That concludes the end of our, our Q&A session for today. So with that, I'm going to hand things back over to Dr. Kassam for closing remarks. Dr. Kassam. Thanks, Ashley, and, and thank you everyone for attending today's briefing and for your thoughtful questions. I want to especially thank, of course, our panelists who, uh, in, in their own right, are not only esteemed but uh, uh, but leaders uh, doing all the the important work that we all need uh, for our for our personal safety and, and our public safety. I also mentioned earlier that this week marks the second anniversary of the declaration of the emergency in Ontario, and, and as we enter the third year of the pandemic, hard to hard to even fathom, frankly. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize healthcare workers for their extraordinary efforts on the front lines. A, a recent survey of OMA members found that the pandemic has exacerbated burnout, which we know affects physicians and others working in healthcare. And burnout is a significant system level issue that must be addressed not only for our physician well-being, but also to ensure that there are sufficient healthcare resources to address the care deficit caused, unfortunately, by this pandemic. 
And you can read more about burnout at, and the OMI's recommendations to address it in the OMI's white paper on the topic at OMI.org. So thank you again for your time. Be well. And uh, hopefully that sun is shining a little bit more brightly in the coming weeks. So thanks so much.